on the morning of November the 5th, 1910, the wind had fallen light, and a sea mist was engulfing the English Channel. The mighty Prussian needed the assistance of a tug to tow her up channel. She was the largest full-rigged sailing ship in the world, five thousand and eighty-one tons, and a length of four hundred and thirty-three feet. This vessel could also boast that her spread of canvas was twice as great as any British sailing ship. When her forty-eight sails were set, she showed fifty-nine thousand square feet of canvas, which was controlled by twenty-six miles of wire and rope. But without wind, she was as helpless as a fish out of water in the English Channel tides. The Prussian was part of the Flying Pea Line, of which there were fourteen other sailing ships, all based at Hamburg. Her owner was a man of tradition, and had not yet invested in steamships, which were now taking over the trade routes around the world. Yet he had been successful enough in his business to keep his large sailing ships working, amongst them the ill-fated Prussian. Captain Heinrich Nissen had made sure the five hundred tons of general cargo had been stowed correctly, as the voyage to Valparaiso, passing Cape Horn, would be a long and hard one. Early that following morning, when nearing New Haven, a steady breeze from the south-southwest had arisen, and the Prussian slipped the tug's toe. Setting all her sails, she made an impressive sight as she leapt through the water in the slowly clearing sea mist. Although the captain of the S.S. Brighton, the New Haven to Dieppe ferry, had seen the large sailing vessel approaching, he misjudged her speed as he tried to pass ahead of her bows. The tearing and rasping of the Prussian's rigging as it raked the ferry's port side must have been disconcerting to the Brighton's ninety passengers. It damaged the foremast, funnel and lifeboats. However, the collision had left the sailing ship in a crippled condition, smashing her jibboom and shrouds. As the ferry returned the five miles back to New Haven, the wind freshened to gale force. Captain Nissen, not wanting to risk his masks, was towed to Dungeness, where he dropped both anchors, hoping to ride out the storm-force winds. But owing to the strength of the wind, the Prussian, with her weakened bows, lost her anchors and chain. Three tugs were employed, which pulled her up through heavy seas towards Dover, where she could be secured to one of the large mooring buoys in the harbour. When the tugs tried to manoeuvre her towards the harbour entrance, however, she became unmanageable, as conditions worsened. More tugs came out of Dover to assist, but to no purpose. At half-past four that afternoon, she parted her tow-ropes and went aground at Fan Bay, a mere mile from the safety of the harbour. Within half an hour, a distress flare had been fired, and the Dover lifeboat struggled out of the entrance of the harbour towards the stranded vessel. Above, on the cliffs, men from the Coast Guard Rescue Unit, complete with protective wicker headgear and rocket apparatus, were painfully climbing down the chalk cliff face. Unfortunately, their rope was twenty feet too short, which made the descent to the beach twice as difficult and dangerous. When the lifeboat approached the stricken ship, the crewmen could see none of the Prussians' forty-eight crew and two passengers, there were no willing hands to secure the rope, which had been shot across the vessel's rigging by the shore party. As it was low water, the lifeboat had to stand off the stranded vessel, as she would have been in danger of going aground herself. Apart from lights in the cabins and sparks from the galley chimney, no signs of life could be seen, so the would-be rescuers returned home, puzzled. By five o'clock the next morning, the gale had abated slightly, and four tugs attempted to pull her off. Their efforts were unsuccessful, and the vessel started to dig her own grave in the soft chalk seabed. It was evident that she would not move until her holds had been lightened. Captain Nissen was taken ashore to consult her owner and agents for the best course to take on the mishap. The gale suddenly arose again, and the captain was unable to get back to his ship. He watched, helplessly, as twelve tugs struggled to pull the stranded Prussian off at high water. They abandoned the task at 2 p.m. The ship had not budged an inch. When asked, Captain Nissen explained to the interested the reason for the crew not wanting to be rescued by the lifeboat. It was because they had all come to the conclusion that the vessel was sound, and if she should start to break up, they could easily swim ashore. Even with fourteen foot of water in the forehold, and sea running in and out of the bow, the gallant crew could be seen cheerily waving to the spectators, who were lining the edges of the cliffs. The following day, as the gale died down, 
Thirteen of the youngest crewmen and both of the passengers were taken ashore. One of the passengers professed that he was a seascape artist, and after this voyage he would have enough ideas to paint for the rest of his life. It was found that the ship's hull had settled into five feet of chalk, and the sails were taken off her yards for the last time. Just before the remainder of the reluctant crew left the ship, Captain Nissen read out a telegram that he had received from the Kaiser. It expressed his deepest regrets to the owner for the loss of such a great ship from the German merchant fleet. It was now up to the salvage company to save the merchandise from below her decks. The coming month was a difficult one for her salvers. They managed to transfer most of her cargo onto lighters, but owing to the winter weather and the variation of goods in her holds, things did not go smoothly. She carried grand pianos, cement, china cups and saucers, coke, and even salt and pepper cruet sets. A last and final attempt was undertaken to tow her off, after dumping five hundred tons of coke, but without success. The ship was then left to the local boatman to pick over the remains. This, at times, was quite lucrative, and a sail in January 1911 fetched one skipper two hundred pounds. The spring gales battered the hulk, and an attempt to break her up as scrap was abandoned later that summer. When her anchors were recovered from the sea at Dungeness, and landed on the harbour wall at Dover, it was speculated that they were the largest ever to be seen at the port. Winter came. And the once proud Prussian broke up, leaving only her ribs protruding from the sea, a condition which has altered little since then, and her remains can still be seen at low water, to this present day.